Hi everyone, I'm Max with Out of Spec Guide, and today I'm gonna to show you how to start, drive, and charge the Tesla Model 3. But many of these tips will also apply to its slightly chubbier sibling, the Tesla Model Y. So keep watching uh, this video because these Teslas uh, take everything you think you know about cars and throw it in the trash. Well, is it the trash? It's Tesla. So maybe the compost or the recycling bin. But anyhow, keep watching and we'll show you how to do everything. So excuse the bending, but uh, this card has seen better days, but hopefully you get a flat Tesla card with your Model 3 or your Model Y. This is how you initially access the car, and it's kind of like, well, literally your key card. You got this, you're a card-carrying Tesla member. So when you have your Tesla Model 3 card, you can see on the back side of it, it actually gives you a diagram of what you need to do to unlock the car. So in the case of me, I have my phone set up with the Bluetooth app. We'll show you how to do that in just a second, but the most immediate way to get in the car with this is to take this card, and like the diagram shows, scan it on this B-pillar camera over here, and that should unlock the car. You can see the power mirrors fold out, makes a honking noise, and the car is basically on, like that. Uh, how do we get in? You might notice these very flush looking aerodynamic door handles. This is a big trend in electric cars, particularly a Tesla. Now on their higher end cars, these are power operated, but in Model 3 and Model Y, they're mechanical, meaning that see what my thumb is doing if you come in close. What I'm doing is I'm pushing in, it pulls out this part, and then I can pull this mechanical latch. It releases the frameless windows to safely open the door, electronically releases it, and then I can just do the rest of the work myself. The door is open, and now you can take a look, voila, the driver's seat. Now, your specific Model 3 might not come with these rolled gold uh, pretzels. They're not a sponsor out of spec guide yet, but we can't wait to have them on. So I'm gonna get in the driver's seat, and just by having my butt in this seat, the high voltage battery system's all ready, I touch my foot to the brake pedal, and all of a sudden, it goes to my memory profile. We'll show you how to do all that in a quick second, but right off the bat, since I'm here, adjustments. If you come in here, you can see you have fairly standard looking power seat adjustments. So you can go forward, back, tilt your seat, um, just to adjust your seat. But the mirrors uh, and the wheel and everything else in this car is a little bit different. So let's show you how to adjust those. Okay, so this middle screen in the Tesla Model 3 or Model Y is the most important component because it has all of your driver information. All of the important driving related things tend to be on the left pane. And let's start with state of charge. The battery is at 41%. You might ask, what does that mean for my range? You could tap it and see your miles. Now, I don't like to use this because this is a guess based off estimated range. You're honestly probably never going to see this because guess what? The real world has hills, uh, braking, all kinds of conditions that mean you're probably not going to see this range. So you might as well just stick with the percent, watch that carefully. And uh, you know, when it gets low, we'll show you how to charge later in the video. Luckily, the power window controls in this car are pretty traditional. Uh, just basically for your front and your rear windows, you can just roll them down here and you have your typical shortcuts to just roll them all the way up by just pulling this all the way up, the power windows will roll up. I find that's fairly intuitive. The thing I don't find fairly intuitive though is getting out of Model 3. So we just showed you how to get in Model 3, but getting out is kind of weird for some people. So you press this button, hold it, you can see the frameless window went down a bit to allow the door to easily open. I keep holding this down and I just do the work of pushing the door open. At that point, I can just get out like normal. I mentioned this because Again, frameless windows. Uh, so that's how you have to get out. You're using that electronic release. Now, hope it doesn't happen to you, but if you're in a situation where your car loses all battery, you're in a bad accident, the high voltage system's down, or the 12 volt, I should say, and the power system isn't working, you're not trapped in here, thankfully. There are regulations for that. Tesla had to put a mechanical release here. We'll show B-roll of how this works. But basically, you can engage this and basically force the door open. You shouldn't do this on the daily because it does damage the windows. They don't like it. But in an emergency, you always have that option to mechanically just force it open. So most of the important controls for shortcuts are actually found on the bottom strip of this touchscreen. So you can see starting with the left here, we have a vehicle icon. We tap that and on the right side, that's gonna bring up a bunch of settings which we'll go over in a second. Then you have your climate controls that you can touch or slide to quickly adjust temperature for. Then you have a shortcut of apps. Yours might look different because out of the factory, this car comes set up a certain way. But kind of like if you ever used an iPhone or an Android phone, um, here you can see you have more apps. You can actually hold apps on this strip and all of a sudden you're in, I like to call it jiggle mode or app adjusting mode, whatever you want to call it, but see how you have all these cancel icons. You can actually start rearranging things and move apps around. So let's say I want to move my uh, radio 
over as a shortcut, I can do that. Uh, and in this case, we have our heated seats as shortcuts because they're not by default in the car. They're actually up here. So you have to take them from this menu, drag them down to the strip and put them there or just adjust as you want. There's also defroster menu as well. Now you might ask, how do I get to all my climate stuff? We'll just tap this temperature and you'll see that you'll have this kind of pretty cool, I think, climate animation. You'll see where your vents are going. Now, this is a really non-intuitive part. It's touch vents. I touch it around and it moves where the air is flowing, um, just like a touch screen. And you can pinch to concentrate the air or expand it. So uh, it's a fairly non-traditional way of adjusting the air, but I think it's kind of cool. Some people hate it, but just so you know, that's how it works. Okay, so when it comes to actually adjusting a lot of the you know power controls in the car, mirrors, your steering wheel, uh, we just showed you how to do seats. Well, this, here's how you do it. So you're going to tap this vehicle icon uh, to bring up the vehicle menu, and then you can see you have a bunch of controls. So even things like wipers are here, because guess what? Wipers in this car are a little bit different. It's funky. Uh, you have a control to fold your mirrors uh, manually if you're parking in a tight spot open your glove box electronically. You can see it just popped open there. Uh, then you'll have to close it manually, but that's an electronic release. Uh, child lock, window lock, all pretty self-explanatory, I think. But here's what I want to get into, adjusting your mirrors and steering. So right off the bat, I'll just say your you know central mirror here, that's just manual. That's not power, maybe next generation, but not yet. But uh, your side mirrors, you're going to engage here. You'll highlight it and you'll see this screen pops up. And all of a sudden I can toggle between the left and the right mirror, whichever one I want to adjust. So left or right. Let's say I want to adjust my right one today because that's the one that's closer to my cameraman, my friend Jordan filming me today. So I'm going to choose my right mirror. Uh, and if you look over at the right mirror, you can see it's there. How do I adjust it? Well, let's go back here to where my hand is on the steering wheel controls. I'm going to use the left of these wheels. There's two wheel, uh, wheels on the steering wheel, two knobs, I should say. And this left one is what adjusts what's currently selected. So when I move it up, the mirror folds up, down, down, left, left, right, right. And if you go back over, you can see the mirror is responding to my inputs. So it is moving to the left, to the right, up, down, etc. Super cool. And then um, once I'm done with that, what I can do is I can save it. And now I'm not saved to my driver profile. I also have a few mirror preferences I can do like auto fold, auto dimming, etc. Those are all enabled by default. If I've screwed something up and I want to restore it to what it was like before, there's that option too. So I'm just going to restore it because I've just made some random adjustments. So that's how you adjust the mirrors. The steering wheel is fairly similar. You just tap on steering and all of a sudden you can see right my steering wheel. I'm using this wheel to go up and down, engage it uh, like that. And then in and out just means that basically adjust how far in or far out it is. So just adjust that to your comfort level and then you can save that to your driver profile. Okay, so the energy app here, you might not have it on your home screen, you might have to add it from this list, but energy app is kind of cool because it shows you basically your consumption uh, based off either the rated range of the car or your trip with your driving uh, conditions and your projected range. This is more like of a guess meter basically based off how you're driving and uh, all of those kinds of metrics. So you can see it kind of breaks down things in a pretty intuitive way here. Uh, how much of the percentage of your charge went towards driving, climate, battery conditioning, which we'll explain in a second, your elevation, you know, hills you went up, and then everything else, very handy little descriptor there. A very important thing with the Model 3 is that it's a sedan, or in the case of Model Y hatchback, so of course it has a trunk, but these cars also have what Tesla likes to call a frunk. Some people hate that terminology, so you can call it a front trunk if you prefer, but you can actually open it from this screen right here. You can open either one. Uh, this is my favorite trend in software design of text that looks like buttons because like this is not an obvious button to me but apparently it is so open the frunk open the trunk you might have heard some noises this model 3 has been around for a while so it might make a lot of noises but uh let's see what that did okay so we've popped the trunk in this case from the uh, center screen in the car you could have done it from the app or just the old-fashioned way by pressing this lift gate button here but now the trunk is popped open and in model 3 this is manual so you're gonna have to push it up the rest of the way uh, and then these gas struts of course hold it up just like most trunks are used to it's a sedan trunk and you can see we actually have a spare wheel in here this doesn't come on Tesla so if you want one you could check out our friends at modern spare they've been a past sponsor of the channel before we like them a lot but Tesla doesn't include a spare wheel out of the box but anyhow fairly big kind of cavity into the trunk it is a sedan. I tend to prefer hatchback because if you have a Model Y, you have more space. But those rear seats do fold down, which is handy. But this is a Tesla, so we've got to show you that front trunk. 
Okay, pop the front trunk either from the center screen, the app, however you prefer. You'll do either one of those methods to release it to this point, and then you do the rest of the work yourself to just lift it. Uh, this is an aluminum lid, so it's actually quite light. And then you can see you have a decent amount of space in here. Older Teslas, uh, like their higher end sedan, actually had even more space, but over the years, as they've added dual motors and all wheel drive, this kind of space is, well, what's what you get. But anyhow, you have a decent amount of space here. I like to put things like maybe a small carry on bag. You could put purses, groceries here, because this is a weather sealed space, uh, which is super handy. Uh, you might also have your uh, Tesla accessories in here, which we'll go over later. But there's a way to gently close this front trunk that I want to emphasize. So once you get it down to this point, um, this is aluminum, like I said, so it means it's light, but it's also kind of delicate. So make sure when you close it that you apply even pressure with both hands, and then you just gently close to uh, make sure it's locked. This funky looking dongle is probably the most common adapter you're going to use for, let's say, charging in garages that are equipped with what we call J1772. It's a fairly common standard in the EV industry, and Tesla, I think, on most of their cars includes this as an adapter. If you don't have it in your car that you're borrowing, you actually can order it from their site. I believe it's like $50. But basically, this adapter sticks into the Tesla once it's unlocked. Uh, it'll stick into the charging receptacle and basically just converts Tesla standard into J1772, meaning you can plug in uh, charge point level two stations, uh, a garage that, excuse the frameless doors, they're a little bit finicky. Um, you can just plug into basically more standard kinds of charging outlets using this adapter. Now, there's another method of actually being able to plug in at uh, fast charging stations like Electrify America and EVGo by way of what Tesla calls their CCS1 combo adapter. CCS is that other public charging standard that Tesla doesn't use because Tesla uses their own thing. Uh, I find it's bulkier and I actually don't like it as much, but there are a lot of stations that use it. So if you want that PSA, you're gonna have to have a newer Tesla. I believe model year 2022 uh, and later safely have it. But if your Tesla is recent, you just bought yours, it probably has it. You'll need to get the CCS1 adapter from Tesla's website. It costs about $250. And uh, if you go on a lot of road trips, it might be worth it. Another charging accessory that comes with Model 3 and Model Y that you'll find in either the front trunk or rear trunk, I don't know, it might depend on the one you picked up, but it's this what we call Level 1 adapter. It's called Level 1 because this, unlike NEMA 1450 or Level 2 charging, is just a common wall socket. So let's say you're stranded in a road trip in an emergency. Oh no, where do you charge? Worst case, I hope you don't have to use this because it's slow, but you can. You can basically plug this into any wall outlet and uh, using this um, EVSE or the, basically this charge unit, it's going to um, plug into your car and trickle charge it. So if you're stranded somewhere, you could plug in overnight or for several days and give your car some meaningful range to get hopefully back to a fast charging station. I showed you the key card method, but really the way you should be doing most things on Model 3 or Model Y or any Tesla is with the Tesla app. So on your smartphone of choice, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, navigate to your included app store, in my case, the app store on an Apple iPhone, find the Tesla app. In this case, I've downloaded it already, but if you don't have it already, you'll wanna download it, um, log in with your Apple ID, whatever you have to do, get it downloaded and we're gonna set it up. So you can make an account with Tesla either on their website or in the app. Then you're gonna open the app and you'll sign in. In my case, I've already got the car added, but let's say you're taking delivery of this car. How is that going to work? Well, you're going to get an invite link to your email, and I think this is super cool. You click that link. Once you're logged in with the app, it opens in the app on your phone, and all of a sudden, your car is registered with the app. That's super cool. However, at this point, your phone's a remote control for the car. To enable your phone to act as a key, kind of like that card I showed you earlier with proximity, uh, so that it'll work regardless of your cell reception wherever you are, as long as the phone's nearby, you're gonna have to do a pairing process. And that pairing process basically looks like taking your phone, going through the process the app guides you through, we'll show B-roll on screen of what that looks like, and then at one point, sliding the card in the center console of the car as illustrated, and then at that point, from then on, your phone is linked as a Bluetooth key, which is super cool, which means whenever you get close to the car um, and trigger these door handles, it'll unlock because it treats the phone just like this key. Okay, so once your car is registered in the app, this is what the app looks like. It shows you an illustration of your Model 3 or your Model Y, uh, and then you have these controls. So you can lock and unlock the car remotely. Uh, in this case, we're in the car, but you could do this from anywhere with an internet connection. 
super cool. You can control ventilation uh, to start ventilation. In summer, this is super nice. You can uh, set a charge limit, which we'll explain in a second. Uh, you can pop open the front trunk, as we showed uh, elsewhere in this video. You can actually also schedule charging. So you could go in this screen and you can actually set, let's say you're planning a road trip or you want your car to finish charging by a certain time, or you wanna even enable what's called off-peak charge to reduce energy costs when you're charging at home. You can play with these options and we'll explain more of these fully in other videos if you're new to electric vehicles. But just so you know, these controls are hidden here in the app under schedule. Then you've got security and in my case, I'm just the user in this car. I'm not the owner. My boss, Kyle, is. But if you are the owner of the car, you can actually add other people to the car, inviting them in this screen uh, with that process of, you know, having them get the link in their email, click the link and everything. And then if you have the key card, you can pair their phone to the car, even limit their speed for certain users, uh, do other safety things like enable valet mode, um, you know, if you're having a valet park your car and also sentry mode, which is Tesla's built-in dash cam functionality, super handy. Elsewhere in the app, you will find uh, ways to basically schedule service, get roadside support, and even get upgrades and accessories, which Tesla is all the more happy to sell you. I think my favorite thing about the app by far is the climate control, because not only can you, you know, start venting, like you can't in a lot of cars, honestly, with connected apps, but you can, because it's electric and it doesn't have to idle an engine, you can preheat the car. So this frosty morning, I was actually able to defrost the car remotely and engaging what I call bacon mode. It's just these, you know, heat venting looking strips to defrost the car remotely while I was in my house. It was doing that for 20 minutes before I even got in because I went here and I hit defrost car. In this case, it's already warm, so I'm not gonna do that. But you can do that, even control to the granularity of a single degree, the temperature of the car, or just turn climate off entirely remotely. I love that feature. So everything with the phone is also linked to the car through what Tesla calls driver profiles. And as of the last year, these are actually synchronized in the cloud, meaning that uh, in every Tesla you get in, your preferences are gonna travel with you as long as you sign into an account. So we showed you the phone process, but in the car, you can see this account system is always accessed in this vehicle menu uh, or just at the top of the screen here you can see where it has the icon of the person i press that and it's going to show me all the profiles on this car in this case this car gets around a lot so it has, it has a lot of owners but i'm going to go to my profile and you can might hear some motors engaging that's because all of the power uh steering and seats are configured to what i like to set them to we're going to show you how to configure that in a second but just know that this is how you access profiles you can go into your driver profile settings and you can actually add a new driver in the case of this car we've reached a limit uh, so we might have to delete a user um, so you can delete users you can go into their uh, basically screen here uh, you can even this is cool with the cloud profile add their email so you can see like my boss Kyle has his email in here. That means it's synchronized to his Tesla account and all of his preferences are synced up in the cloud. He also has what's called easy entry enabled. That's just a feature where when you get in and out of the car, the seat adjusts so that you can more comfortably get out uh, with room so that you're not, you know, clonking your knees against the steering wheel and all that. So I like that a lot, but I'm just gonna go to my profile. It's all here. Another thing I should mention with profiles, very important for me, is that media controls music, your apps, what you're signed into, like your Spotify, all of that is actually synchronized based off your profile. So when you switch driver profiles, it'll let's say switch your Spotify account or what have you. And that I think is super neat. Okay, so it's fairly standard in terms of turn signals in this car. We'll get to driving in the next section, but I wanna to touch on wipers because the wipers in this car are mostly automatic, but there's also, they're sort of controlled by this uh, button here. So when I push that button, you can see that it actually brings up wiper controls on the kind of driver side screen here. So I can manually adjust my wiper speed uh, or have leave it on auto. And the reason I mention this is because Tesla's auto wipers are not the best. So you might wanna just press this end button and uh, just toggle between your wiper speeds because sometimes uh, it just chooses the wrong setting. So I'm gonna leave it on auto for now. Now, if you wanna use the jets, I'm not gonna do that right now because the door's open, but you would just press and hold this and then it would engage the washer jets, clean your windshield. Another thing I should mention on the stock, your high beams are here. Now, auto high beams are 
pretty standard on this car. It's standard on a lot of cars, but if you want to manually control them, you can. You just pull in. You can see that when you do that, uh, you pull in on the stock, it actually brings up your light settings. So auto high beams in this case are enabled, but if you want to turn them off and do it manually with the stock, you can. Um, and you can also control your just auto headlights in general, but I'm going to leave everything on auto for now. There's a few other settings I want to touch on before we get driving. So if you go uh, you'll see there's tabs here right? we've talked about controls. There's also pedals and steering. And what that does in Model 3 and Model Y is it controls a few parameters. So you can change your acceleration between what's called chill and sport. So keep in mind this, especially if you get the dual motor performance trim or even the single, honestly, rear wheel drive Tesla Model 3, they are fairly quick cars if you're not used to high torque electric vehicles. So if you want to get used to the pedal, you don't want to, you know, uh, floor it right off the bat, you can just go on chill that just reduces the sensitivity of your accelerator pedal. I like to leave it on sport because I'm used to it, but do whatever you're comfortable with. Then this is fairly standard. Many cars these days have electronic power steering. Uh, in this mode, you just configure whether you want your steering to be comfortable, soft, sporty, and firm, or right in the middle and standard. Then you have your stopping mode. And this is important because it gets into what we'll get into the driving section with regenerative braking. So I like to have hold behavior, which means that when I slow to a stop, lift my foot off the accelerator, the car is going to brake hold. Uh, this is actually common in a lot of gas cars too. It's nice in traffic. It just means the car holds itself, uh, won't roll down a hill. Now, if you want to have that, if you just want it to be more like a traditional like, manual car, you can enable roll. And then if you want it to be like a torque converter automatic car, you can do what's called creep. That's the functionality where when you're at low speeds, you lift your foot off the accelerator. It's like it's always engaging first gear and just slowly moving forward. Then you have your regenerative braking, which is toggleable in this car as of recent software between low and standard. I like to use standard because that means you can effectively drive most of the time with just the accelerator pedal either modulating it down or releasing it. And we'll explain that in the driving section of this video. I want to talk about media controls. So the nice thing with this car is it lets you use a lot of media sources. When you're setting up the phone app, you'll actually be prompted to set up your phone with Bluetooth. So if you just want to use your phone over Bluetooth, you absolutely can do that. And then just, you know, stream podcast music, whatever you want from your phone, including phone calls fairly standard in most cars. Now it also has built-in apps for Spotify and I believe now Apple Music. So if you sign into a streaming service you like and you, you know you get your tunes playing, I'm going to mute it in this case, but let's say you're playing something, um, it's going to show up here in the mini player. If it doesn't, uh, then that means it's probably showing this icon. So you can tap this icon on the lower screen that brings back up the mini player. I love the mini player. It basically is just this kind of interface element of this little strip that shows, in this case, your music controls. So what I can do uh, on the left side of the steering wheel here is control my media. So I can click it to play and pause my media. I can raise the volume by tilting it up or tilting it down. That's going to adjust the volume. And then I can skip between tracks, see, you know, forward and back just by controlling it left and right. Uh, so that's a cool kind of multi-function dial, um, just a way to control your media in the car. Really like it. And then you have your standard controls. If you swipe up, you can configure uh, more audio elements and you'll just see some suggestions from your music app, as well as like in Spotify's case, the ability to like a song. So driver controls are fairly standard, even though Tesla doesn't label their multi-function steering wheel knobs. Most cars have a you know volume knob on the steering wheel. However, how does your passenger control volume? This car doesn't have a volume knob, right? Because everything's on a touch screen. Well, in the case of volume, it's this strip here on the right. Uh, so you can toggle between left and right, or you can do what I like to do and what I think is natural on a touch screen, tap it and then just slide to smoothly uh, gradient your volume. Then you have these, and these are, if you want to get nerdy like me, you can adjust all of your audio settings. And then if you want to be like my boss, Kyle, you can give your music a very V-shaped curve, pump up the bass, uh, you know, chill in the club if you want that, or just adjust the balance to whatever you want. Fairly standard audio controls to adjust all of these parameters. All right, you've waited long enough or you've navigated to the chapter in the video. Congratulations, you're an advanced user. It's time to actually get driving in the Model 3. So we have a stock, so I put my foot, because I've unlocked the car, my foot's on the brake, and that activates the drive line. We're all ready. There's no start, stop engine button in this car like there is, and honestly, a lot of other EVs. Tesla just makes it very frictionless. So you have the stock here, and uh, what you can do with this is toggle it down once to get into drive. And you can see that puts me in the drive. All of a sudden, 
this screen changes a little bit. Now, if I wanna go into neutral, I can tap up once. Now I'm in neutral. Let's say I went through a car wash or somewhere where they wanted me to do that or my car was on belts, you could do that. Then I wanna go into reverse. I'll just put that up twice with the stock and now I'm in reverse. You have your standard kind of backup camera like you do in a lot of cars as well as your nice blind spot views on the side so you don't curb your wheels. Then if you wanna get back into park, you just press in here so we're gonna go, go into drive, and now we're ready to actually go once I close my door. This car is very good at warning you when you do stupid things like I sometimes do. I'm in drive and I'm not moving. That's because I have hold enabled and regenerative braking. So to actually start going, I just have to, well, push that go pedal, push that accelerator, and now we're off to the races. And because we're in standard regen braking, which is what I recommend, we're in a mode where if I lifted my foot off the accelerator right now, we're gonna to come to a stop and you can see the speed lowers, you know, until eventually you stop. I would roll into a stop at a traffic light or let's say I had to stop quicker. I always have my brake pedal. Feel free to use that for emergencies. This car may be weird, but it always does have a brake pedal. However, I love one pedal driving because it does mean that effectively a lot of the time, all I'm doing with my foot is either modulating the accelerator pedal down, mashing it, you know, to get that fun electric car acceleration or releasing it and I'm getting regen. And you can see, if you look over here that when I'm using the throttle, the car is outputting power, right? Uh, it, it's showing me how much power I'm using. This bar can go theoretically all the way to the right unless the battery is really cold or you have certain conditions where it won't go all the way. Now, when I lift my foot off, it's gonna go, whoa, way in the green zone to the left. That means that it's using regenerative braking. So not only does regenerative braking put you to a stop, which I like, but um, it charges the batteries because instead of using the disc brakes, like you know, you're used to in a lot of cars and this car still has with the brake pedal, it's using the motors and just rolling them backwards. And in that process, it's basically reversing them. They act as generators and they put charge back into the car. Now, pardon me if you've heard this explanation a thousand times before, but for people new to electric cars, I think explaining this concept is super useful because it means effectively uh, that the car will uh, gain range when you're going downhill. Now, I wanna clear up misconceptions here. There's been some marketing and I don't wanna say which companies say what, say what, but some people will say their EV is self-charging. They might be referring to regenerative braking. There are effectively no real world driving routes where you're gonna gain range with regenerative braking. It's not a panacea, it's not the solution to perpetual energy. All it is is a really cool efficiency hack to basically mean that let's say you are going downhill uh, on a route um, you're just gonna gain a little bit more range or lose a little bit less range because you'll make it up on the downhill. But of course, every time you go on an uphill, well, you're using range. So just keep that in mind. We haven't invented perpetual motion yet. But as I'm driving in the Model 3, it's really cool, really smooth, uh, electric motors, so they're quite quiet. Um, and I'm actually gonna pull a U-turn here it's just so we're driving away from the sun when it's safe to do so. And again, I'm just, I'm not even touching the brake pedal right now. I'm just using my, um, well, now I'm touching the brake pedal because I'm in a stop, I'm in hold, but just to slow down, I didn't even have to touch it. I was just able to use one pedal driving. So, you know, most of this is just like a normal car. Uh, I just modulate the accelerator pedal. I'm using my steering wheel. It's all fairly standard stuff. And of course, I didn't even mention my speeds right here. So this takes some getting used to. I don't have a heads up display. I don't have a driver's gauge cluster. I do have to look here for my speed. But honestly, I find you get used to it. You'll also find the representation of the world around you as the car sees it with what Tesla has uh, in terms of their computer vision. So this is all the cameras and sensors around the car, seeing the world, recognizing traffic signs, recognizing the lanes, and using all of that, super cool. Now, this is something that I think we have to be very careful when discussing because I like this a lot. It's super useful. It'll even show cars around me. Right now, we're luckily on low traffic roads. So there's not a lot of cars around me, but we'll show soon when cars are around me, it represents them. However, don't live in this world. Don't stay concentrated on this. I find this takes some getting used to. Like this car has great visibility, thankfully. So just look outside, drive like normal. Don't get too distracted by this fancy screen. It's over here when you need it, but uh, generally you should just be paying attention around you. Now, because we're in a highway setting, this is a perfect time to use Tesla's adaptive cruise control uh, and lane centering, which they call autopilot. So this varies a lot in every Model 3. There's what they call basic autopilot, full autopilot, and even full self-driving, which is what you might've heard of when people say, oh, Teslas can drive themselves. They can't, by the way. But full self-driving is a, con <laughs> a topic we'll explore in another day. Today, I just wanna talk about adaptive cruise control, uh, which most Model 3s have 
the one you're in probably has. Uh, so how do we enable that? Well, we just tap down once on the stock because we're in drive, we're cruising along. I tap down once and you can see the car has this uh, max speed indicator and it's just doing cruise control. Uh, and it's also adaptive uh, base, so it'll follow the car in front of it. Now, if I wanna slow down, what I'm gonna do is you look over here, I'm adjusting my speed, scrubbing it with this wheel. So just like I adjust the volume on the left with my media controls, I'm using the right to adjust my speed. And how do I adjust my following distance to the car in front of me? Well, I just use left and right. And you can see when I do that, it changes uh, the following distance so I can, you know, be in full BMW driver mode, uh, minimum, or I can go to uh, Lexus uh, retirement home driver mode uh, all the way to the max if I want to, anywhere in between, and adjust my speed. Now, that's all well and dandy, but this car doesn't just have adaptive cruise, it's got an autopilot package that also has lane centering, which is also, I think, common, I believe, in most Model 3 and Y sold now. Uh, with, I think it's a $3,000 package. Prices are always changing, so don't quote me on that. But um, if I double tap down on the stock, I'm now using what's called auto steer. And you can see it's auto steer because you can see this blue steering wheel icon if my cameraman zooms in on that. Uh, that's how you know you're in auto steer. Now this mode is very particular. It's not self-driving. I have to emphasize this. You have to keep your hands on the wheel. If you don't, the car is gonna get mad chimes are gonna happen, it'll eventually cancel itself out and stop you in the middle of the road. So keep your hands on the wheel, but if you do that, apply light pressure, you don't have to you know, force the wheel, the car is steering itself. It is centering itself in the lane. You can see pretty well, honestly. And I found Tesla's system is one of the best at recognizing, in our case, you know, sunny, beautiful Colorado, unfortunately has a lot of mixed road conditions, sometimes pretty bad road paint. Uh, but the system recognizes it pretty well on centers. Now, in my case, auto steer turned off. I think I get freaked out because it's, uh, the sun's high up in the sky right now. And, um, that's again why these cars aren't self-driving. These systems aren't perfect, but when they do work and you have auto steer enabled, let's say in a highway setting, something even more controlled than where we are right now, I find it's honestly really nice. Um, but yeah, I should mention, you might've heard this topic phantom braking. So even if you don't have auto steer enabled, let's say you were just an adaptive cruise, don't relax too much because you, let's say the sun's up high in the sky, some Teslas have been known to randomly just stop in the middle of the road because they think they see an object in front of them and so the car is doing an emergency brake, but really it's just seeing a shadow of a bridge or something random. This has happened like to numerous people, several states and several Teslas. Hope it doesn't happen to you, but be ready. So what I would do is anytime I have adaptive cruise enabled, I'm still keeping my foot on over there, just slowed down, I'm not even sure why. But uh, th there you go, phantom braking happens. So when it does, just have your foot over the you know accelerator to be ready to cancel that in case you need to. And how do you get out of adaptive cruise or auto steer or any of these modes? Well, once you're in them, all you've gotta do is just tap out of it. And now I'm just back to normal driving. You can see all of my blue uh, smart driving displays are gone and I'm just driving like normally again. So that's kind of a quick note on how autopilot um, works. Full self-driving, again, is a whole separate can of worms that we'll get into in another video. But those are the basics of just, you know, the adaptive cruise and lane centering as they work in uh, most Teslas. Right now, our state of charge is 37% in the car, and it's actually getting nice and warm and sunny out here in, you know, Arvada, Colorado. However, some days it's winter, and if you've driven a gas car in winter, you know something's behaved differently. One, it starts out really rough, the engine doesn't love it, you know, reactions have to happen to kind of warm it up. Electric cars aren't like that. They always start pretty awesomely. Um, that's not an issue. However, when the battery is cold, regenerative braking is reduced, and you'll see that with an icon. We can't show you it here in live action, but I'll try to show a B-roll clip of what that looks like. Basically, that icon indicates that regenerative braking is reduced because the battery is so cold that it can't really accept the charge that the regenerative braking would give it, so the car reduces regen. I mention that because this is an important safety thing. If you're really used to the way one pedal works, and I don't blame you if you are, then you might be caught off guard by this. But when you see that icon and the car warns you, just be aware that when you lift your foot off the accelerator in those situations, the car will not come to a stop as slowly or predictably as you might be used to. You're still gonna, you're probably gonna have to use a brake pedal more. So just 
I would be aware of that uh, when that does come up. It's not only in cold, I should mention, it's also very high states of charge. So if your car's at 99 or 100%, then it's gonna do that as well. Uh, so if you live at the top of a hill, don't full charge your car. And in general, for the vast majority of Teslas, I would say don't full charge them. There's one exception where new Teslas that come with what's called a lithium iron phosphate, I believe, battery, you can daily charge those to 100% overnight in your garage. That's totally fine. Uh, but unless you have a base model rear wheel drive, new Tesla, lithium phosphate battery, uh, and if you, what I just said is gibberish to ignore it, most situations, please don't charge your Tesla at 100%. The default charge limit to this car is I think 90 or 80%. Tesla says you can go up to 90. I would honestly, most days only go up to 80. Why is this important? Batteries like to be in a kind of 10 to 80% zone. Uh, so overnight, don't leave your battery, at, you know, very low states of charge because it's bad for it. And then when you're charging your car, just usually I would say respect the charge limit. Now, if you need to go on a long road trip, you need to start with 100% battery, that's totally fine. It happens now and then, you know your needs, but you know, better than I do. However, just daily on the regular, I like to not charge past 80%. It's twofold. One, it preserves the health of my battery, but two, it also just means that I'm wasting less time. So if I'm charging at home at overnight, it doesn't make a huge difference. But if you were at a public or a fast charger, um, you're just charging slower. The more, the more full your battery gets, the more kind of ramps down the current. And eventually you're gonna just be trickle charging, wasting time with the charger. Uh, and if there's a queue of you know people waiting and you're 85% and you don't need to charge more, well, the respectful thing to do at that point is just to stop charging. Uh, so just keep that in mind. States of charge as they get higher uh, will just be a little bit harder on the battery. So if you don't need to be above 90%, don't go there. Okay, I pulled into a supercharger. Importantly, I navigated to it with a Tesla navigation. That's important because it was cold today. The battery needed to precondition, meaning that it got warm so it can accept faster charging. If you wanna learn way more about it, Kyle, my boss, and I did a video explaining battery temperature and all you need to know. But basically, we're here at the supercharger. I pulled in. Uh, it's very important with Tesla superchargers to plug in, sorry, to park as close as you can. Uh, most, well, Model 3, all of Model 3 and Model Y are uh, pull-in, meaning that you reverse in, they have the rear tail light here. You're gonna tap on it to open it. This one's a little old, seen some better days, but anyhow, that'll open up and you'll know you've parked close enough because the cable for the supercharger will hopefully have enough length to just, well, plug right in there uh, with no stretching. So you can see this Tesla logo, it's blue. Uh, it's gonna start flashing, a uh, darker blue, and then eventually it's gonna shift to a green color once the car's authorized to charge, and it is. And that's that easy. That's the great thing about Tesla supercharging. The vehicle communicates to the charger, and it's linked to the Tesla profile that set up the car with that payment info. So let's say you're renting the car with Hertz. They're actually gonna bill you automatically uh, at the end of your rental, uh, pass it on, which is easy. If it's your friend, well, there's always Venmo, Zelle, or maybe uh, you can just let them pay for it and not mention it whatever you want to do. But yeah, now I'm charging. Um, so easy as that. You can go in the car and see that it is charging currently. Uh, excuse the very sunny conditions. It's 40 minutes remaining now because it looks like it wasn't fully preconditioned. We're getting about 115 kilowatts. This car can see a peak of all over 200 kilowatts. Um, most Teslas can go to 250, the new ones now. So our charge limit is set to 90%. We can go into charging here and change our charge limit. I really recommend dailying 80 90%. If you have a trip like Tesla's here shows, you can override it to 100%. You can also stop charging from the screen or unlock the charge port um, if you know it is locked because you can do this remotely from the app, but let's say you wanna have your friend unlock it while you're out and about, you can do it because while it's charging and you walk away, the car is actually just going to lock. Uh, so that's nice handy. You can go grab lunch or whatever. I will say, keep an eye on the Tesla app, have notifications enabled because once your car is at you know, 80, 90%, whatever your charge limit is, and it's done charging, Tesla's gonna charge you idle fees for using a supercharger and hogging it. Uh, and it's just not nice to your fellow EV owners. So when you're ready, when you're done charging, make sure you come back as quickly as you can so you're not charged idle fees, unplug and um, get out of here. And then you can you know, drive on your way. Uh, so how do you unplug a supercharger? Well, I'll show you that right now. It's pretty easy. I'm gonna keep charging after this, but I might as well show you. So we're charging all well and fine. We could have stopped charging from the car, but we can also, because it's unlocked, we're near the car, stop it since we're here. So all we gotta do 
in this situation is just press and hold on the cable button there. I'm pressing and holding, and then I can release it because that light is flashing white. I can return it gently to the cable stall, uh, and then automatically that uh, charging flap just closed. Super easy, love how that works. So that's the superchargers. You know, you use them on road trips, DC uh, current, uh, direct current going into your car, very rapid, really handy. However, at home, if you get your box installed by Tesla, it's gonna look like this. This is what they call a level two EVSE. They also have this at this Tesla server station, uh, service station in Superior, Colorado. But these are great uh, because they will just charge your car slower. Uh, they're great overnight in those situations when you don't need a rapid charge. They're also a bit easier on the battery, just alternating current, it goes in. Uh, uh, provides a steady stream of usually less than 10 kilowatts continuously into the car uh, and that just works out fairly well so you could use those as well not on road trips so much but just hotels overnight wherever you'll see you know these kinds of tesla um, level two chargers as we call them as opposed to the dc superchargers another thing i want to mention about superchargers is there are some superchargers where you can uh, basically pull in those are meant for let's say you're in your model y maybe model three but more likely model y and you're towing uh, you can you actually use those because obviously if you're towing a payload you couldn't really reverse into these superchargers i can't find where those are at the station but i think some of the newer stations have them uh, those are nice because well Again, you're towing, you can use them. If you're not towing, if you have no reason to use those, please don't because there's very few of them. And most Teslas, if you're not towing anything, you should just reverse in and uh, plug in like so. Um, but yeah, that's just my quick PSA for that. Okay, so that's the basics of how to start, drive, charge, and configure Tesla Model 3 or Model Y to your liking. I hope you enjoyed this video a lot. Now, if you wanna see other Tesla coverage or you watch this whole video, no on a Tesla, you hate Tesla, I don't blame you. And you want to learn about other cars, Out of Spec Guide is here to help you as well. We do coverage on all kinds of content. So let us know what you want to see, what questions you have, or what uh, you feel was left unanswered in this video. Thanks so much for watching. As always, Out of Spec Guide is here to help you navigate the world of EVs as a basic user. But if you like where we went into today and you want to get into full nerd territory 9000, there's always the Out of Spec Reviews channel as well. Thanks so much for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time.